Yeah. Hey, Leo. Thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, give us a little background on yourself. Morning. Yeah, I am uh, Leo Lopez. I'm a practice growth director at Aluna. I've spent the last 13 years or so in tech. Um, born in Mexico, raised uh, in California and Arizona. Went to ASU. A big fan of your product, Brian. Great. And why sales for you? Good question. Uh, in general, uh, I believe in doing what, you, what you're good at and doing what you love, right? You put those two things together. Uh, and then as a, a psychopath once said, if you're good at something, never do it for free. So sales pay, it tends, tends to pay very well. Uh, I don't know if quoting a psychopath is, the first, is a good thing in the first 30 seconds. But yeah, that's, that's in general, that's why I got into sales. Cool. Well, let's start with why you're good at it. How'd you get good at it? It's a good, well, so in general, people always say you have to be really, you have to have the gift for gab to do sales. I don't agree. I just don't agree. I, I'm a believer that anything can be taught. Um, when I was young, I did have that tendency, the, the propensity towards speaking, but that doesn't necessarily mean I was good at sales. I became good at sales when I started listening, when I started adhering to uh, a philosophy, um, a system, right? Creating your own system. So what I think made me good at sales is, uh, I'll use a comparison. I've trained martial arts my whole life. I have several belts, right? The one I'm most proud of is the beliefs in the philosophy that there's many ways to the top of the mountain. There's no one way, right? You might get there through Taekwondo. Another one might get there through Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a Krav Maga. There's a business. I've trained like 20 something arts. Uh, not all of them black belts, right? But I've trained all of them enough to understand they're all good. If you find your way to the top, you have to have some sort of structure to get there. So what made me good is I applied the same philosophy to martial arts, that I, to sales, and inevitably, I, I think I got pretty solid at it, right? I mean, every sales guy thinks they're amazing, but, you know. <laughs> the W-2s <laughs> may not <laughs> right, yeah, that amazement. Of, every, of, everyone's, yeah, everyone was like, I'm amazing, right? It's like, ah, you know, are we all that good? <laughs> well, I, I love that point because... You know, I've been on this journey for a couple of years now, and every time I equate what I'm trying to do physically with what I'm trying to do in sales, it makes a lot more sense than I, when I do it in my head. Huh. The um, the have you ever heard of, like the comparison that I was in high school and I remember doing a class of math, and then I went to my English class, and the same concepts were being taught just from different angles. And I was like, this is the same two, you know, two negatives make a positive, right? Right, two negatives in language and in math, it's the same exact thing. And I remember just sitting there going, so they're just teaching us like five things just from different angles, right? So it's the same thing happens in physical and in verbal, right? Your brain is still in control of everything. There's only a handful of things that control everything. It's just whether it manifests through golf or sales, it's kind of out to you. Well, I don't know. If, I mean, I'm yeah, it, it, it does. And a lot of how you get better at both is pretty much you have to do the same things. Yeah. Practice, right. deliberate practice, take some feedback, have the instructor show you, correct you, repeat, take that feedback. And what? a lot of people just want to, well, they see it in the movies. And that's how everyone gets into it, right? Oh, you hit a soft spot. Brian, I, and I'm not pandering here. I'm a fan of your product, right? So the reason I took the time to do this, I really am a fan because, and I listened to your to your, uh, to your the podcast, you're 1,000% right. People in the movies, they watch a, they watch a movie. Uh, Will Smith's kid has a problem, and then he does a montage, and he's a karate master in, in like six months. And you're like, hold, stop everything. Stop everything. I once practiced one kick for five years straight. Like every single time, and to this day, I've been training 25 years, to this day, I still practice the same exact kick over and over with a coach, with my, my, my Sifu telling me, right, with somebody, I record it, I see what I do, I drop my left hand slightly, then I do it a thousand times without dropping that left hand, and then I notice my right hand is telegraphing, so over and over, it's the same exact thing, so I, I agree wholeheartedly, I think Sandler called it um, reinforcement training, They're, you know, everyone's got their... Everyone that knows what they're doing has their own verbiage for it, but 1,000%. You, you need to have it reinforced. You need to have it trained properly. 
Yeah. And how long did it take you to figure that out? Did somebody show you or did you just your de sheer determination and fortitude? The, to, yeah, it's a, it's a really insightful question. So I was 18 years old and I walked into this. Uh, my, my best friend is this great guy. I've known him since we were 13. He's a, still a, my, one of my best friends. He's a detective here in Scottsdale. He started at this martial arts school, didn't like it, but he paid a year in advance. So he's for my 18th birthday. He's like, hey, man, happy birthday. I got you a year of karate classes. And I was like, all right, I've always wanted to train. When I was a kid, I'd read books. I'd watch Bruce Lee movies. So I walked in. I met this man named uh, Alex Santa Maria. He's a grandmaster. He's in the Hall International Hall of Fame. I didn't know it. I got very lucky. And I just started training with him. I didn't know how incredible he was until he started showing me things that defied logic to me that I'd never seen. The Bruce Lee's one-inch punch, all that stuff that I thought was just movie stuff and then he started he, he basically showed me the cool stuff and then he goes let me show you how i got here and then he broke it down into pieces and he goes this is how it works right i'll show you i'll give you the tools you got to still build the house so to answer your question i learned that very young i was very fortunate uh to realize kind of what it takes to get great at something complicated yeah and how do you react when like the younger rookies come to you and they go hey leo you know you look like you know what you're doing what's what's the secret to your success give me some tips and tricks uh i actually i find that to be very um fulfilling right uh it's the well the hedonism paradox i think it's called right the the more you do for yourself the less happy you are and the more yeah. you do for others the happier you become so i find that extra i still do it for free I probably shouldn't, <laughs> but whenever anyone I've worked with in the past reaches out, I'll gladly jump on calls and do trainings and coach them as to what I think it takes to be great. I give them advice in general. I, I actually guide them in certain directions, certain coaches that I think are really good. Uh, the other thing I, I ask, you have to be able to read. I mean, I know most people can read, but they choose not to read, right? Yeah. So as somebody once said, the difference between an illiterate man and a man who chooses not to read is, is hard to spot, right? How do you how can you tell the difference? Whether if even if you were completely literate and choose never to read, you're basically illiterate. So I ask them, you have to read, and I guide them towards certain books. You know, I once again, there's no one way to the top. There's no one way to the top, but if you choose the challenger method, the sandler methods, a variety of different methods, they all kind of get there. So what do I advise them? A, start reading, B practice as close as possible to the real thing. So what, and I hate to go back to martial arts. I hate grandmasters who proclaim all these things and it's all fake. It, it's useless. It doesn't do anything in the real. I always say, okay, do it on me. Hit me with it. And I've, I've been hit very, very hard. I've had the entire left side of my rib cage broken. I've had stuff, but I learned, all right, now it works. I believe in you now. I've had grandmasters proclaim things and go and hit me. And then I just stand there. That is terrifying that they're teaching people. Same thing applies to sales. If you're, I tell them, get as close to humanly possible to what you're really going to run into. So either like when one of your most recent podcasts, you said, how do you practice, right? How do you actually get good in front of people without being in front of people? You think one of your philosophies don't practice in front of people, don't practice in front of your clients and like that. Um, I always say, Try to mimic that as close as humanly possible without actually, obviously, you know, you're not in front of a prospect um, because the reality is when you're up there, when you're up on stage and comedy, or when you're doing um, any sort of real sales in front of a group of people, nothing duplicates that. So you try as much as possible to duplicate it in real life. But like, like martial arts, you prepare. So you, you train. Very, we, we train to an extreme. Sometimes they accuse us of being abusive of our, of, our style does not make money. My grandmaster will never be rich because very few people want to get hit that hard, want to deal with that level, uh, pushing the human body to a certain point. But you're right. We, we, we tell them, look, I love you. You're a friend of mine, but I'm going to come at you now. And then it gets, it gets bloody. A, a lot of broken noses, a lot of, a lot of, it, sometimes it happens, right? Uh, the, 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 the head bleeds a lot. The head bleeds a lot. People, people always think it's, yeah, it looks it's a, it makes it bleeds a lot. There's a lot of blood up there. It always looks worse than what it is. What we yeah. always say. And who helped you get better, or how did people help you get better at sales when she, when you started? Yeah, so my first mentor in sales would be a guy named Ted Mascaro. I was at a company called Veracor. So I went to Veracor. It was commercial collections during the Great Recession. Can you imagine that? 
um, it was rough, right? So I actually did collections, then moved over to sales. Um, very similar collections and sales. You're selling, you're painting a picture with words. You're selling them on the idea as to why they should resolve something amicably outside of court. And it's commercial. It's not like, hey, your credit cards do. It's like, hey, you owe $800,000 to my you know, customer in the UK for product that they shipped to South America or something like that, right? So my first mentor was Ted Mascaro. Um, brilliant man, high school educated. I mean, he always said, he goes, I'm high school educated and was very, became very wealthy off of uh, a lot of hard work. And the way he put it is, um, uh, he's like, you know, we give you a tool, it's up to you to sharpen it, right? If you just want to bludgeon people to death with it, okay, that's a lot of hard work. If you want to sharpen it, uh, it makes your work a lot easier and you get a lot more work done. So that was his philosophy, I believe in it. And what... What do you wish you knew back that first year that you know now about sales? Yeah, I was I was like that question. Mostly discovery, right? Just asking the right questions. You can ask the right questions, uh, and then everything gets laid out for you. It's a Socratic method of inquiry. Was what what four thousand years ago, right? It worked for Socrates. It's it people forget that it works now. Um, people think that selling is talking. And I'm actually not used to doing this much talking, right? Right now, I'm doing almost the time. <laughs> I don't like. It. Oh no, no, no! But I mean, this is the this is the the conversation, right? But in reality, you know, this when you're selling, if you're talking, you're losing. Yeah. And right? why but do you think people get that wrong? Because I see too many people getting into sales because they have that gift for gab personality, which can be a good start, but that's just a start. Movies don't help us. Yeah. Right. I mean, the movies, they always say uh, the, uh, the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? The greatest move sales. It's not. It's it's the, I don't know about you. In consultative, exactly. yeah. um, consultative, complicated, uh, complex sales, screaming at people. Right. You know, you see this watch, you know, it's still a great scene. It's great acting. Right? <laughs> I, I, I don't basically know word for word because, you know, it's great, but it's not truly selling. Right. That's just kind of yelling at somebody. Um, great selling has been said by somebody other than me, a, a greater sales trainer said uh, great selling is uh what is it black sheep right is that is that the one where where he goes selling the, those uh the um the comedian come on he passed away way too young uh, uh tin man you mean no 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 it's a fat guy in a little coat What's his name? oh chris farley chris yeah. farley yeah him, uh, him. Remember oh, he's yeah, going? yeah black sheep and um he's tommy boy tommy boy right when he's going selling those those car parts that is a sales job, right? Because he starts off, it's a sales, that's a sales uh, movie. He starts off pretty bad. He keeps taking note, right? All this stuff. He doesn't know how to explain the things. He overcomplicates. Remember, he takes the thing, he crashes it, and it lights on fire. Like that's, everyone's had a that type of moment in their career. And then he starts getting better at it when he starts talking to the waitress and he's just relating to people and asking right questions and getting, right? Seeing it from their perspective, right? Not confrontational, but side to side. Um, I so to answer your question, I think movies hurt us a lot. I think it's given us a bad name, and um, and and people come into sales with the wrong expectations, thinking, "Hey, I can talk a lot. That makes me a good salesperson." That that's not necessarily true. Yeah. And what's your motivation? What's your why? Why are you so driven? I I actually this one is pretty clear. So I have the world's <laughs> most beautiful wife. Um, if you don't believe me, uh, just Google Alba Felix model or Alba Felix. That's my wife. People don't believe it. I've had people ask for photos because <laughs> they wouldn't believe that that really was my wife. Um, side note, Ted Mascaro, my first mentor said, uh, if the guy that you're interviewing has a girlfriend or wife that's too good looking for him, hire him on the spot because he'll be the best sales guy you've ever had. And I was like, man, you're dumb, Ted. I was a young guy. I was like, that's stupid, man. You're overgeneralizing. And then the older I get, I'm like, well, I mean. It's not everything, but he's, he's not wrong. He is not wrong because my best reps have been have been guys who, whose girlfriends or wives are too good looking. So what motivates me? I met my wife when we were young. I was broke. I had less than $20 to my name. And I once told her, I said, hey, I, I'm so broke. If you leave me now, I don't blame you. I said, there's the, you know, I love you. I adore you. If you leave, I'll never speak ill of you. I'll never say anything bad. I think you're fantastic, but I don't blame you for leaving me. Um, and she looked at me dead in the eye and goes, it's me and you to the end of the earth, hon. So I said, all right. She was just my girlfriend at the time. I said, all right, now, forever and ever, I will work hard to make us as much money as humanly possible to give us a very comfortable life. So that's what motivates me. So you're driven by love and romance? 
Very, yeah, yeah, look yeah, at my you. pug. Yeah, my pug. I have a dog that I adore, and my wife, and um, and they are my life. And yes, that that's what wakes me up. That's what that's what gets me going. Um, there's a certain amount of competitiveness, but I it, it's competitive in a healthy way, right? You want to do better, but I never want to see others do poorly. I want everyone to do well. I just want to beat you by, you know, I hope I do $1 more, you know, <laughs> um, but mostly my motivation is very internal. Right? It, there are goals that I have for my family and I. Yeah. And <clears throat> I take it there's a lifestyle that this partner would like to pursue. Yeah, yeah, it's mostly me actually. She's from Is very humble, she's from very humble background. Uh, she's uh, Mexican as well. And she's from a very humble background. Didn't have a lot growing up, and so she, that, that's why we get along. I I did. I have a, I'm a strange dichotomy. My father was a lawyer, and my mother comes from a bunch of uh, doctors. Um, I'm ja actually Japanese Mexican, so on my mother's side, there's a lot of Japanese people, a lot of wealth. But then my family directly didn't, because unfortunately, my father chose to be the the lawyer that represented the poorest people in the world <laughs> didn't take any of that 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 uh, that that uh, illicit money, and he always represented poor people. So we didn't have a lot growing up for me, even though he was a lawyer. And then we, I, my friend, my mother brought me to America when I was very young. So there were some times when we didn't have a lot. Um, we had a great family, just didn't have a lot of wealth. So I think that kind of creates in my culture a um, an insecurity. Right. Sometimes that, that we want to pretend to have more than what the, than what we really have. Right. There's this thing. Um, I hate to quote him because he's a madman, but he made a good point. Kanye West said only millionaires wear chains. He was talking about how the richest people on earth don't have gold chains. Don't I work with a, a billionaire. Right. At, at one of the companies I worked at, literal billionaire, one of the richest people on the planet. And he wore like New Balance shoes. And we were, you know, Brooks that were, you know, they cost like 90 bucks. He didn't wear 50, you know, $500 shoes, right? They weren't $5,000. They were just shoes, you know? The guy looked like he came from Walmart. Um, and in my culture, unfortunately, a lot of times we start to wear flashy stuff because I think it's covering up insecurities, uh, right? That we kind of grew up with. Kids that grew up with money say that money doesn't matter. Well, I, I get that because like money means different things to different people, mm -hmm. right? I mean, to me, it means independence. I don't need to kiss up to anybody and follow anyone else's rules, do what they say. I do what I think is right for me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, other people- That is a great place to be, I think. And it, it took a long time, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had, a mentor, had a mentor from my church when I was young, Joe. It was awesome. He goes, Leo, because we were getting into his, uh, his, he and his wife did very well and they lived in Scottsdale. And I remember looking up to him and he, we were getting into his navigator, brand new Lincoln navigator. And he goes, look, Leo, he goes, I know money isn't everything, but if you got a problem that money can't fix, you got a big problem. And he goes, I'm talking health, death. He goes, it can fix a lot of problems, man. And he's like, I'm not saying it's everything, but it sure does help. So I, I do believe in that philosophy. Yeah. And what do you feel is your sales superpower or strongest characteristic? So in general, if I had to have one superpower, it's um, there's a movie where the X-Men, I don't know how much of a nerd you are. I'm a big nerd, right? So there's a movie where the X-Men, you're aware of there. I don't know how much, how much you like, but at the first five minutes, most of the X-Men are killed off by this machine that essentially adapts to everything that it's attacked with. So the, the ice man attacks it and it, it adapts and be, can now use ice. The fire guy that taps him, he's like, oh, I now have the power of fire. It, everything that is used against it, it just adapts and becomes better. So if I had a superpower, I can listen in and steal, right? I'm you're the world's greatest thief. You've heard that from every salesperson. Anything. If it works, I will do it. If you tell me standing on my left hand while I play you know, the, the harmonica with my right and making phone calls works, I will find a way. I will become world class at it. So I got a superpower. I'll steal anything from anyone that works as long as it works. And I think that's kind of the antithesis of a know it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, a, in a positive way, not in not a positive in a way. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I've, been, I've been called a know it all, but not maybe not so, such a positive light. <laughs> well, uh, when I think of a know it all, I, I think of somebody who you can't really discuss anything with. If anything goes wrong, it's always somebody else or something else's fault. They've mm -hmm. never made a mistake in their life. 
as opposed to a sponge or, or I don't know what that mm -hmm. characteristic was, but that mm -hmm. person who will adapt and augment their skills to fit the fight they're in. Mm -hmm. You yeah. should not be the same, same salesperson year one and year seven. Yeah. You should not be using the same tools, saying the same things. Let's hope not, right? Let's hope you're getting better and adapting. And, and how do you keep your game at this level in sales? So I do believe that, that uh, and the idea of, uh, I think it's been called iron sharpens iron, steel sharpens steel, right? Being around other great other people. Great people. Um, yeah, it just, it, 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 the, there's, I just listen to so many podcasts that they all kind of mesh now, you know, but one of them, uh, I don't know if it's Stephen Dubner, right? From Freakonomics. I think it's he, his philosophy is nobody's smarter than all of us combined, yes. right? Nobody's smarter than all of us combined. So I, and I met very smart people, right? And I don't care how smart you are. There's still a group of people who will always be smarter than that. So how do you, how do I stay sharp? Because around myself with elite people like Tyler Witt is actually the reason I found you was Tyler Witt on, on yep. LinkedIn. He's, been on he's, the a show. Great, he's a great buddy of mine. Uh, we work together at ZocDoc. He's incredible. And a group of people like that, you share ideas, you share philosophies, you tend to live close together. There, there are certain things that you kind of share. Um, that being said, I do believe in diversity because uh, one of uh, your most recent guests spoke about the role of women in his career. I believe in that. I believe in just different views. That's the same concept, right? Nobody's smarter than all of us combined. You get different views from different backgrounds. There's always something you never even thought of. Happens to me almost every day. I'm like, ah, I never in a thousand years would have thought of that. And now I have insight into it. And I'll adapt it to what I do. Yeah. And is there a reason that you haven't gone into leadership or... So I did go into leadership early in my career. Veracraft's how I moved up when I had my mentor. Um, I became a big fish in a small pond, and then I wanted to get into tech. And I don't know if you know this, tech doesn't care if you were the president of a small country. If you <laughs> ever did, right? And they're like, they okay, good for you. With Ecuador, never heard of Ecuador, right? They're like, good luck, right? Um, until you get into tech and then do sales in tech, then you have to move up, right? So i become a viable candidate a few times. Uh, it's uh, like at Zenefits, I did get into leadership, uh, a couple other roles I was going to move into. It's been fun carrying a bag too. Uh, I, there, there's the advantage to doing both. I do believe that um, I'm fortunate enough to have the skill sets to do both well. There are sometimes people are really good managers and not great salespeople. They're solid, right? And sometimes people are really, you see this a lot. Great salespeople are just not good coaches and not good leaders, right? It's the Michael Jordan effect, they call it. Right? Well, He's, you know, plus the motives are so orthogonal. Yep. Because if you're motivated by winning and money and success, then you become a manager and all of a sudden you have to do that through people that you haven't built that skill yet. You, mm -hmm. you tend to just drag them along with you as opposed to supporting them. Very, I couldn't agree more. And then unfortunately, uh, I've actually contemplated, I drew, I drew an outline with a couple of my cohorts for a book uh, that I think would be really interesting. It's about how sales leadership has failed corporate America and has failed a lot of organizations because we have a tendency to promote salespeople into leadership when they won't necessarily have the underlying characteristics needed to be successful in sales, right? It's, right. I, I don't know how good of how Bill Belichick can throw a football. I don't, Right. I, I don't know if you watch football, but I don't I'm pretty sure he's pretty terrible as a quarterback, but he's a pretty dang good coach. Right. And I love me some Tom Brady. I don't know if he's a good coach yet. He might be, but he has yet to prove that. Right. So just because you were a really good player won't always mean that you're a good coach uh, or a good leader. Right. And actually, most of the time, you know what they say, if you want to lead people, you know, walk behind them. Salespeople right. tend to want to go front and this is me. I'm amazing. Right. You know, <laughs> so. And what skill or capability that if you really improved and focused on would take your game to the next level? Direct skill that would actually get me somewhere else. Get you, um, I mean, because you obviously went into tech for a reason. Yeah. And I think I know the reason is, right? It's great opportunities, millions of jobs, yeah. you know, unstoppable future. Totally get it. And I love tech. I grew up with it, right? Tech is secondary to me. I, I'm just a tech nerd as well, right? So it's a passion of mine. Uh, but what skill would I actually keep developing? I mean, I, I don't I don't want to harp on discovery and asking the right questions. 
uh, but th that's big. The other one is the ability to empathize. Um, there's a, a great writer, I think it was the editor of Fortune, wrote um, uh, Humans Are Underrated, or is that, is that, is that, it's one of his books. Anyway, one of his books, he talks about how artificial intelligence is going to take a, this was before even ChatGPT and all the, all the things that came forward. This is four or five years ago. He talked about how artificial intelligence is going to so, slowly start to creep into white collar jobs, not blue, not just blue collar jobs. And as it starts to creep in, the thing that's going to allow people like you and I to stay employed is the ability to empathize and connect human to human because a computer can't do it no matter how much you teach it. Well, th this is the dichotomy that I'm frustrated with. Why did we hire sales people? <laughs> because we sell to people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And I would say if engineers could do it, then, then you wouldn't need, or if it sells itself, it's one of my favorite things. If it sells itself. I was like, then why am I here? Right. Then why are you paying? Because I'm not cheap, right? You're paying me a good chunk of money. Why, if it really sells itself, you know, I hate to make the joke, but you know what sells itself? Drugs, you know, cocaine, whatever, heroin. I, I, I'm joking. I mean, I'm not trying to make light of addiction, but that sells itself. Everything else, like software, it's not, come on, come on. Well, let's face it. When we really want to make a significant change in our life and our business and the way we work, we need to talk it through with an expert. Mm -hmm. We don't go on Amazon and just gamble, hoping that it shows up and it does what we think it does. <laughs> and then you buy the shirt and it's so small. You're like, what is it? Did I get bigger? Did somebody? Well, I mean, how many times is that? I'm a big yeah. Amazon guy. And uh, one out of 10 purchases, I, I open the box and I honestly say, did I order this? <laughs> <laughs> Was I drunk? How drunk was that? You're like, when did I order? It? Saturday night, two in the morning. Because, there it is. Because it doesn't even look like what I was thought it would look like. <laughs> yeah. And I try well, and blame Amazon, but then I get in and I go, "Yep, yeah, that's what I ordered." <laughs> that's what I ordered. Oh. I believe in the 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 philosophy. What people say is, people love to buy stuff; they just hate to be sold to. And so, as salespeople, we're not necessarily we're not always. How do I? This is this is a personal thing of mine. I am close friends with uh, one of my best friends in the world's military intelligence, highly elite, incredible what he does, does not do sales. And he was goes, why'd you get into sales? He's like, you could have got into, because I mean, this guy's a, a, literally like a war hero, a literal war hero, God bless him, right? Uh, incredible stuff that he's done all over the world for America. And he, we're, we're close friends with a handful of pretty elite guys, right? People that I think think at a high level. And they, I'm the only sales one. And they always the sales guy. And they always go, why do you do sales? I'm like, they always kind of belittle it. So then I was go, stop your train, stop everything. First of all, uh, without salespeople, it, all your businesses would come to a grinding halt. Just a dead stop, right? There's always the argument. Well, without operations, I go, yeah, but we're coin operated. You put the coin in first, and then it starts to operate. So first, where everyone's coin operated. All right. Second of all, what their perception of sales is, buy, sell, trade, you know, Glenn Gary, all that stuff. That's not real. So that's what I've told them all the time. The stuff you've seen, we have a bit of sales salespeople just have conversations with another human being about what they care about and what they're trying to achieve. And then we give them the best advice we can possibly give them. And sometimes it correlates with our product. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, that's I mean, I, I, maybe I'm simplifying here, right? But that's, that has done wonders for me. Yeah. And what do you think managers get wrong about great salespeople? Fantastic question, but I, mean, I, hate, I hate to keep thinking about it, but I think you've done this once or twice. You're like Joe Rogan, right? You, you've done this a couple of times. A couple of times. Look, well, a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. You've been doing it a while, right? Let's hope so. If you weren't asking good questions, I'd be concerned. Okay. So what do sales managers get wrong about sales people? Great the, sales people. One of the big, about good, good sales people? I great think one people. of the big, uh, what was it, great sales people? Well, I think they get mediocre sales people pretty well. I don't think they understand. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. That's a good point, and it goes to what I was what, what I was thinking of is you can't just pretend to work. So once your KPIs become so tied to pretending to do things, they've gone off the rails. You, you're with me, like mediocre people are great at, at pretending. <laughs> yeah, stuff that looks good, and they're like, I always do the, you know, kind of banging away. The, Banging away. I used to make this joke, right? When we'd be in the office, you're banging away, boss. Banging away. Yeah, just, you know, really getting after it. And you're like, stop pretending to work and actually work. If you spent that much effort 
actually working, the results would be incredible. So sometimes what they get wrong is they go, well, to, with some great salespeople, they go, you don't look like you're doing that much compared to Billy over there who's just beating his head against the wall. You're like, yeah, well, Billy doesn't understand sales. He's harassing people. I'm actually doing something on behalf of the company, protecting our brand at the same time and allowing us to scale like a muscle, right? Instead of like a tumor, right? A tumor is still cell growth, but that'll kill you. Mine is going to make us stronger and be able to defend ourselves when we need it. So yeah, you, you hit a soft spot there. That, that is such a common thing with, with uh, especially green sales managers. And, and it's not just green. I see it so often today. And it, it's ruining because the great ones get annoyed by that. And the mediocre ones, well, I know how to game the system. So there I'll it is. It. There it is. And then you know what happens? You know who gets promoted? Yeah, the mediocre one. The mediocre one who's been playing the <laughs> right here, boss. I'm oh, working real hard, boss. You're working in there. And you're like, and is, is she, is he? You know, you're, you're going, juggling chainsaws is not easy. We just great sales reps make it look easy. That doesn't mean it is. Right. So just because it looks easy doesn't mean I'm not working really, really hard. I'm getting the result. It's just pretending to work hard is, is who's it helping? And, and I think your muscle tumor analogy is really accurate there because one is building muscle and the other is creating a cancer. That's going to kill you sooner or later. And it's it is going to kill you. It, it's going to kill the organization. And there, there's this whole, the, the reason I came up with that concept for that book that I'm actually uh, working on, right? It's a work. I actually wrote another, I wrote a book called How to Date Out of Your League, which is funny. Uh, and it's, and then if you see the photo, it's just me and my wife. And it literally, the cover, it's great marketing. It just says, this really is me. This really is my wife. Give me $4.99 and I'll, I'll tell you how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's really self public, but, but, but it, you know, I, I took the time to do it. Right. But anyways, the other concept that I'm trying to work on is this cancer that is destroying all these companies in corporate America is, is allowing, and, and Steve Jobs called it the Bozo effect, right. Allowing B players uh, in the room. And then once, and oversimplifying, but once you allow a B player in the room, a B player will never hire an A player. Never. A B player will only hire other B and C's and mostly C's and D's because he or she wants to feel better they're intimidated it's, their, it's a manifestation of their own insecurities and nothing makes you more insecure than standing next to an elite a and then they go i am very sure it's like standing me standing next to a six foot six basketball team i'm like i am very sure i did not realize these these men are gigantic right so you feel insecure that that that's not me i have an odd sense of confidence for a guy my height but um it, it, that's what creates issues within corporate America because then those B players keep promoting C's and D's and perpetuating it. And it tends to alienate a lot of A people. Uh, it's very frustrating. It creates a difficult work environment for A players. Um, so it's, 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 it's a concept that I'm working on that is kind of close near and dear to my heart. So. Cool. Hey, this has been a fun conversation, Leo. Where can people go to connect and follow you and buy your uh, book? I uh, right now, just on my LinkedIn, I will publish. I will. I will uh, promote it on my LinkedIn, uh, Leo Lopez, and I, I work at uh, Luna Care, Luna Health, right? So, because I'm sure there's a lot of Leo Lopez's. I thought it was a unique person until I try to get an email with Leo Lopez. There's 14 billion of us apparently on Earth. There's more people, more emails than people <laughs> with Leo Lopez. <laughs>